So welcome everyone to the Power of Your Financial Set Point. This is Paul Bauer. And this is an interesting one for me because I never used to have an issue with this. I, I had a coach many years ago that talked about your financial set point. And I thought to myself, well, I don't really have an issue with that because money was never a problem for me for such a long period of time. And I feel very lucky about that. And I was teaching people about abundance for, for a very long period of time. This issue did become an issue for me after my wife, Susan, passed away. Um, in fact, it, it was happening in the background while she was going through her cancer ordeal. And I didn't really see it. I didn't notice it. And as you are aware, if you've been doing any type of personal growth or introspection, you know that when you look within yourself, you're going to see a certain amount of issues, beliefs um, through awareness, through being aware about your own thoughts, your own emotions, and your own way of seeing what you see in life or how you see life. So for me, it started creeping in over the, the years and then this really came to a head, let's just say several years ago, and I had to become aware of this issue. So you know the old issue or the old saying that says we teach what we most need to, to learn. Well, this one was one of those salient things that came right to the surface because even though I had Camelot years with my wife, Susan, for so many years, um, all of a sudden the wheels started falling off and things just kind of like got disrupted. So, hmm, interesting. So, so then I stepped back and I started doing some digging. And the purpose of that digging was to not just get good at it for myself, which is, that's okay, but it's to help others realize their financial set point, get underneath that and say, okay, why? What's holding me back in my abundance and in my finances? So that's a little bit of a, uh, primer before we go into what we're going to talk about. So your financial set point has, has been called the hidden number that shapes your life. And we've seen that to be true in so many different ways. At least we're giving it a context now. So what if this set point is the ceiling, which we're going to go into in some great detail as we go tonight, that it both limits and holds you back from what you're capable of in terms of earning allowing in, and your capacity for wealth and abundance. It affects your career. It affects the choices you make. It affects your family. It even affects your leisure life because when you think about it, everything in your life is determined in some way by what money flows in your life, even if you're really good like at awareness and you've done meditation for years and you're very self-aware. Money still is one of the key drivers in this three-dimensional world, like it or not when we're really honest with ourselves. So what is it? What is financial set point? In essence, it's the ceiling. It's the top limit of what you think, not consciously, this is unconsciously, of what you're capable of in terms of making and earning and also saving. That's a real key. It's the upper limit of what you can earn and accumulate. And it's your, also your mental and your emotional comfort zone. And that's an important word or phrase to, to think about for the rest of our lives is it's a comfort zone. It's like, yeah, how much am I willing to earn? There's an old book that uh, I remember buying many years ago, How Much Joy You Can Stand by Suzanne Falter Burns. Think about that phrase. How much joy can you stand? You can take the word joy out and put in money or abundance. How much money can you stand? How much abundance can you stand? For most people, that set limit is predetermined not by some external force, but by something within us that happens over time that I'll talk more about as we go, that both limits and holds back and, and makes us feel kind of weird if we start making a little too much. And it may not be a conscious weird feeling, but it's going to be like a foot on the brake pedal of what you feel you can't accomplish in terms of your wealth and abundance. Now, the big one is it affects how you feel. That's the big one. The level of comfort that you feel with your wealth and abundance in your life is determined not by this conscious mind, which only maybe if you're super self-aware, you have about maybe 10 plus percent of awareness and the direction in your life. But if you're honest with yourself, you know that the subconscious drives the bus. The subconscious is what carries all these programs and what creates and holds the set point of what you're capable of earning and saving and accumulating. 
And by the way, that's 24 seven. It affects how you feel in the background all the time. Yep, even on weekends. <laughs> now I say that with a little bit of a lightheartedness because um, this isn't dire news because when you become aware of something, that's the key. So in essence, your set point, your financial set point is the thermostat of your money and your finances. So if you look at this picture of this thermostat, think about it. If you start earning too much, what happens is it's to, it, the air conditioning kicks in. It's like it's too much heat. And all of a sudden, you, it's going to bring down that temperature so that it doesn't get too uncomfortable. You start making too little, it'll bring it back up again because there's like a lower set point as well. You know, you've got to pay your bills. You've got to get by in life. This internal thermostat is emotional and mental. And it's set in the background for whatever reasons. Hmm, we don't know exactly why, but that's what tonight's about, is discovering some of those reasons. So let's talk about this salient thing known as money stress, which affects everybody to some extent, even the richest people in the world, by the way. No one's immune to money stress. A recent study shows that 73% of Americans say that money is the number one stressor in their lives. In fact, in terms of relationships, it is the number one stressor. And over 80% of millennials and Gen Z are affected by money stress. So our youth are affected by money and uh, financial stress even more than we are. In other words, when I say we, I'm 64. Um, so if you're anywhere above 40, 45, or 50, you know, we've had it a little bit luckier. Our younger generations are being born into an, an era of more austerity in terms of the jobs that they can select or in terms of an economy or the belief systems, but especially with all the financial debt that they're being foisted upon by the educational system, which we won't go into that. That's a whole nother story. So how does it control your money and finances? It applies pressure when things start getting uncomfortable. It's kind of like the foot on the brake analogy that I talked about before. You're, you're going along and you're, you're doing pretty good in life in your career, you know, in your family life, you know, you've got just enough to, to make it by, or maybe you're living really comfortable like what I did with Susan, you know, and then something suddenly applies the brakes and it's not from your conscious mind. It just gets triggered. Something occurs in your life. So what do you do about that? Whoa. At first, you don't know what to do. You just kind of sense it like, uh, yeah, it's a, ask yourself right now in this moment. Where do you feel uncomfort when it comes to money? Tune in for just a second. Think about money. Think about your bank account. Think about how much you earn. And where do you feel that in your body? And take a deep breath into that. That's a good step of awareness. Now, the good news is your financial set point is not static. It changes over time. It can go up. It can also go down. In my case, it dropped. So it changes due to life conditions and events. And I can tell you from my own personal history that that is most certainly true. And I'll go into a little bit more detail as we go. Also, your thoughts and emotions, how you think and how you feel can alter your financial set point. Hmm. Wow. Yeah. Yep. It can be that simple. Now that doesn't mean you're going to change your set point overnight. That if you're, let's, let's say you are making a hundred K a year, you want to change that to 200 K your thoughts and emotions are still going to control that. You're not going to just going to will yourself into 200 K because something's going to happen in the background where the homeostatic uncomfort will bring you kind of sort of down. If you aren't prepared, that's why most people, when they win the lottery or come into a very large sum of money, when they're not prepared for that money, end up losing all of it or great large sums of it because they don't know how to manage it. It's not part of that vibration. Those mental and emotional programs that were woven at a pretty young age. So what maintains it? This is really important to understand this. Your subconscious is what controls your financial set point. You've probably seen me talk about this for years if you've been on my mailing list for any length of time or if you're new this iceberg analogy is very appropriate because what's beneath the water is your subconscious. What's above the water is your conscious mind. Your subconscious is what controls 90 plus percent of all your behaviors, thoughts, actions, 
and everything that happens in your life. And you, some people think that you can kind of like do affirmations and try to reprogram your subconscious. Mm. If you've tried that, you probably notice that it doesn't work or doesn't work very well because your subconscious is so much smarter than just trying to say, I'm rich, I'm rich, I'm rich. Instead, like when I work with clients, and I've done this a lot for myself, is when I say something from my conscious level, I also want to see and feel how my subconscious responds. So one of the processes that I teach my clients is how to listen to what you've said consciously and how the subconscious responds to it. Because if it doesn't agree, it will create dissonance. It will throw the brakes and kick in that financial set point or whatever type of set point occurs in your life. And it won't make a difference what you say or even what you intend for yourself because the subconscious is controlling 90 plus percent of your thoughts, actions, and behavior. Yep, the subconscious drives that much. So how did it form? How did your financial set point form? When you think about it, 80% of it formed before age seven by what you learned in your primary caregiving household. From your parents, from your family system, watching your uncles and your aunts, but especially while you're at home. And you can see that picture of that dad and his little girl as they're pouring over the finances. And that little girl is taking in everything her daddy thinks and feels. There's the real key word. He might not be saying things to her, but she notices how he feels. In my household, when I was a kid, I didn't feel any friction when it came to money. But I did notice that my dad was kind of brooding. You know, he had a kind of like an intensity about himself when it came to things like money, although he didn't talk about it. See, that's what's interesting. Our beliefs don't get picked up just by what you hear as a child. It's what you notice. And as a child, you're incredibly receptive. You're picking up everybody's thoughts and feelings. Because in that wavelength, Jose Silva taught this, when you're before age seven, you're in like a theta wave all the time, which means that your mind is so open. It's just like drawing things in and you're picking up how your mom is thinking and feeling, how your dad is thinking and feeling, and how your brothers and sisters, but the mom and dad are the archetypes. What they thought and what they felt about money became the prime drivers. In other words, like the, the library, the table of contents and the chapters down to the verses and all the words and the beliefs that formed about your finances, your finances, your abundance, and your set point. And what got formed were beliefs, not just about money, but having enough and being enough. So many of us, when we don't feel enough in our adult life, those issues, those beliefs, harken all the way back to when we were below age seven, typically. The rest formed due to your life experiences. Now, this is where it gets kind of cool and really interesting, because let's say you've done some inner work, you've done some coaching, you've done some therapy sessions, you, you know, you've excavated some of those beliefs about not having enough, not being enough, not doing enough. But then there's other things that like either triggered or turned things on or, or turn things off. And you, you, you thought like, okay, what's going on with me? Now, this is what happened in my life. You know, I was going along doing really well financially, emotionally, spiritually, physically, everything was fantastic. There were a couple of deaths in my family that happened, um, which were not fun. After my dad passed away, my the wind in, in my sails just went away for months after months. I remember having to go on like a vacation to California to see the Redwoods and just thought about that recently. Like, wow, yeah, oh, I remember that vacation because I needed some solace. I needed some time to grieve. You know, there was my archetype, you know, this big man this powerful man who's no longer here, even though we were prepared about his passing away because he had, because he had Alzheimer's. Um, when someone goes, you can be prepared, but then you're really not prepared when they finally go. And um, it threw me off. It really, really kicked me off of my balance or my, my normal set point. <laughs> and it kind of dropped what I was capable of in the short term. But the good news is, is it helped me understand these deeper feelings, which is I, what I hope for you, what you do is instead of seeing it as an obstacle, whenever you hit a set point, whenever you hit a, a maximum of earnings or accumulation of wealth, uh, and you want to retire, let's say, comfortably, 
and it's not there, instead of thinking negatively about that, maybe it is a call to action. Maybe it's a message from your higher self, your subconscious included, to like wake up some knowing inside of you. If you've been listening to any of my videos over this past year or so, that's one of the central messages that I teach. And that is, what is the hidden benefit? What's that lesson? What's that gift of the quote unquote negative experiences that really aren't negative? They're just experiences. So let's talk about the fight or flight um, paradigm or that effect that happens when um, things don't go well. In fact, when things like get really kind of like not good in our lives. So negative news events when they start happening, layoffs, market downturns, all of these act as triggers that turn that fight or flight response within us on and kicks into set point in the background that we're not aware of. And you start thinking negatively about your portfolio or your 401k or your job or what you can and cannot afford. There's the key. That's the set point coming up and saying, okay, something's wrong. We're going to have to like batten down the hatches. Whether or not it's true, whether or not a recession is happening or not, which by the way, we're not in a recession, but if you read or listen to the media, and I'm not casting aspersions on the media, the point is, is that it depends on what we believe, what things our mind and our emotions are impressionable by, you know, like what we're listening to, what we're allowing ourselves to be mm, predisposed by or distracted by. So some set point triggers can be like post-hypnotic suggestions. If you've ever been hypnotized, which every person on the planet has been, whether they realize it or not, we all go into trances like frequently throughout our day. You get hypnotized watching Netflix. You get hypnotized looking at your phone. You get hypnotized through any number of things. Now, in this case, a post-hypnotic suggestion would be something like a stress event happens in your life. And suddenly you go, uh-oh, something's not right. Oh, no. Um, I'll have to stop spending like this. I'll have to stop doing things normally. I'll have to play it safe. I can't do what I used to be able to do. We can't travel. We can't, we can't uh, live the way we used to do because things are bad. Now, then, then the mind kicks in. So th let's step back. Okay. The set point in the background is like this emotional, mental, negative guidance system. And when I say negative, we won't you know, describe that too much. Um, we won't blame it too much is what I really mean. In this situation, the play it safe part of the financial set point is it's like this early warning system, whether it's true or not, or appropriate or not. That's something to watch out for. Become aware of that. If you're taking any notes, write down, what am I triggered by? What am I noticing about my own behavior that when someone says something, for example, a news source, that a recession is on its way, or you know, Google just laid off 10,000 people, or Amazon laid off X amount, ooh, things must be getting bad. Well, it really isn't telling the full story. The point is, though, that the set point is kicking in and trying to like batten down the hatches like we talked about before. And this fear or fight or flight response kicks in. It changes your heart rate. It changes your autonomic nervous system. And whether you believe it to be true or not, whether it's true or not, isn't the point. The point is you're actually feeling it in your body and that's what kicks in these set points. So there's a phrase that just dawned on me this morning as I was going for a walk, FICO stress. Here's another post-hypnotic suggestion that happens. Whenever you think about a new car, a new home, a new loan of some kind, you think to yourself, oh, how's my FICO? It might be running in the background. This is also part of your financial set point. Your FICO is a form of your financial set point when you think about it. You know, it's an indication of not who you are, but your financial life. And there's this, this FICO stress kind of like sets in. And my question to you is, how does it affect you? Like, is it just a, a number? Or are you like most people and they equate their identity with their FICO score? If it's an 820, 
You know, if it's a 750, if it drops below 700, oh, there's set point kicking in. Oh, yeah, I can't get a loan, at least not a good one. Under 650, what am I going to do? 600, uh oh, 500, what's going to happen? You know, it's like the Wizard of Oz. Everything is going to, to hell in a handbasket. This is where issues of self-worth come in. If you look at your FICO score, it's as if it's a measure of your self-worth put upon us by these standard setting bureaus. All it really is, is creditworthiness. And all creditworthiness is, is, is a moment in time of how much will they loan you at what percentage rate? That's what it really comes down to. How safe a, a bet are you according to the universe? No, actually it's not the universe. It's these companies. Please, let's not get caught up thinking that it's a measure of our self-worth because it's not. But the, the next thing that kicks in is self-judgment. What happens when my FICO score drops? Mine used to be an A20. I remember uh, a car dealer saying he's never seen one that high. And then as things started falling apart in my financial life, it started dropping. And I felt some of this stress. And I thought, oh my goodness. And I wasn't aware as I am now of this issue because this has come front and center for me. Really clear, I get it. Clear this issue in me and help it clear within others. And we're talking about real evolution of how we see wealth abundance and finances in our life. The truth. Let's get past the self-judgment of, do I have enough? Am I enough? Am I doing enough? And let's get into something that makes more difference to us. But before we do talk about that, let's talk about something that I can really relate to, financial trauma. When a parent, a spouse, or when anyone in your family passes away, these create a level of financial trauma that kicks in this financial set point in a way that you're not even aware of like that man in that graphic there. You know, he's covering his eye. When you think about that is I can't deal with life, tax, debts, bills, all over the place. And the fear of failure kicks in. Your, your set point is in full motion when these things occur without even realizing it because it's Remember, running in the background 24-7, even on the weekends. Job loss is another thing that creates financial trauma. There's a number of events that do it. These are just a couple that I want to point out because I want to bring these out in the light. Let's demystify them. And let's also just kind of like just say, okay, we realize what these things are. They have no power over us unless, of course, we give our power to them. So can you reset your financial set point? Can you dig deeper within yourself, find out what it is, and increase it so that you live comfortably, so that you live in an abundance mindset? The good news is, yes, you betcha you can. So let's talk about the how. Step one, where are you at right now? If you're listening to this live, take a few moments. Hopefully, you've got some paper and a pen there. Ask yourself this first question. Write down your income level right now. No one's looking, all right? What's your income level right now? Now, if you're listening to this as a recording, press the pause button, take a few moments and do that. Then write down what your income levels have been over the past five years. You might start noticing a pattern just the moment you heard me ask that question. Yeah, notice that the past five years, What's your income level been at? Mm, yeah. Also, how much you've saved. What's that current level of savings that you've got now? Now, if you want to just go a little further, look back into your savings and say, okay, when did I have, if I had more, when was that? You know, in my situation, when Susan was just doing great, you know, we had an incredibly healthy portfolio. Well, things changed quite a bit. You know, the wheels started falling off the cart, you know, for her medical condition. And this very healthy portfolio started getting used up and used up quickly, you know, for all the different health treatments that we used for her. Well, that savings dramatically dwindled. And you betcha that it changed my financial set point. Yeah. Step two is discover your beliefs. What do you believe about money? This is huge. If you, if you have the, the desire, if you've got the determination, if you've got the drive and the awareness to, to look underneath the surface, 
You know, in other words, with that picture of that iceberg, what's underneath the surface is what's driving all of this on the outer part of your life. What is creating the, these issues about money in your life? You may not know them 100%, but just ask yourself, what do I believe about money? About money? Is there enough of it? Do I live in, a, in, a, in a, a friendly universe? Do I live in an abundant universe? Do I think that I am a vessel of source of God? Or am I separate? Do I have the belief that I don't have enough because of something? I want you to do some inquiry and take some time offline and really do some digging in respect to this question. And in terms of having enough, what do you need in order to have enough? What are your beliefs about being and having enough? Now we're getting a little deeper. What is enough to you? What does enough mean to you? Step three is transform your beliefs. This is probably the as challenging a part as step two. This is not something you're going to do overnight. This could take days, weeks, months, hopefully not years. The real key to transforming your beliefs is the intent that you have. Because if you remember what I said before about the subconscious, your subconscious is reading your intent all day long. Just an affirmation alone is not going to change your behavior. Oh, yeah, you can kind of psych yourself out. I'm a good networker. I'm really good at writing. I'm really good at this. But what's going to take it over, what's going to create the majority of your results in your life is the subconscious carrying forth those programs. Now, the good news is that 95% of the time, what's in your subconscious is very appropriate. They're, those beliefs are very serving. And less than 5% are not serving you. If you have any stress, if you have any dissonance, if you have any parts of your life that you feel that are not working in accordance or in harmony with who you are spiritually, mentally, emotionally, physically, then you know something's going on in your subconscious. And the real key is having the fortitude and having the intent and the natural love for yourself that you can dig deep within yourself to discover the beliefs and transform them. Transformation happens not overnight. It happens, hmm, let's do some right now, okay? I want you to close your eyes for a moment and really allow yourself to feel how you feel about money and abundance. Become aware of how you think and how you feel about what money means to you. Ask yourself this question. Do I create the energy of money in my life? Or is it something that I respond to? In other words, does it drive me instead of me driving it? How much of my energy do I place in trying to fix the money issues in my life? How much stress do money issues cause in my life? How much of my power am I giving to money? There's a huge one for most of us. Even the richest people on the planet get stressed out about money. And what that really means is, all the way to people who are abjectly not abundant, or at least not high earners, we all are, we're all abundant on the inside. That whole expanse of from poor to rich, there is something that we all share in common when we're stressed about money, and that is we have given away our essence to it. And when I work with my clients one-on-one, -on -one, what I help them discover aren't just the beliefs, which are huge, and how to transform them, but to what degree have they given away their God-given energy, power, sentience to things like money? It's almost like you decided, okay, yeah, I'm going to give at least, uh, let's see, today I want to get stressed, so I'm going to give 30 or 40% of who I am into this issue. It's not just with money. I'm just giving you one example. So the real key here is, as I mentioned before, is to become aware. Become aware of what you're thinking and feeling in this situation about money as it pertains to 
your set point. And the set point, as you're probably getting a pretty good feel now, is what determines how much is enough in your life. It's not the cause, it's the result of all the beliefs that are on the inside. And there are many set points that happen in our life. In other words, there, there aren't just financial set points. There's set points of love. What I mean is, how much love are you comfortable with? How much love can you take in and also give? How much emotion can you take in and express? How much recognition? You're, you could have a set point about how you look and how you feel. The real key is acceptance right now in this moment of who you are as a, as a flow, as a channel for the divine and a willingness to let go of the old self. Just kind of breathe this in as we speak. Pretend like this is a meditation where you're hearing your own heart, your own emotions, your own gut talk to you. The subconscious is revealing some of these old beliefs. Yeah, I picked up this. And if you have a willingness to let go of those old thoughts, emotions, and identities, many different identities, by the way, that you formed as time went on, do you have the desire to move forward free of these old issues, these old, hmm, false, fraudulent, wedded beliefs, as Rick Jarrell, the author of Creating the Work You Love, called? wedded to a fraudulent ideal of who you were. Your choice is, do you choose to move forward with those or do you want to let those just dissolve and return to sender? Just let them go right back up to source, to God, to creator. Knowing that you are from the source, that you are abundant on the inside, that you are whole, because that's what abundance truly means. So if there's anything that you should be seeking, it's seeking to remember your wholeness. So my invitation to you is take some time to do some digging that we talked about in step two about the beliefs. You know, this is a ongoing thing that you should be journaling at least once a week, at least that much. Like, okay, what are my beliefs about money? What have I ascribed? You know, like what's this thing that I think about money relative to how I see it in my life? you know, in terms of my FICO score or my family system or um, how I think about affording things or my career. Why do I do what I do? Have I traded myself for something called money and given away part of myself? Is that huge or what? Most people in some form of their past, you'd have to answer yes. I've done it many times in my past, but it's time to do the digging Come to like having your own coming to Jesus moment and say, hmm, yeah, what beliefs did I create that formed this set point in my life? Am I satisfied where I'm at? Am I okay having a set point where I'm limited that I can't do the things that I would love to do? Create a new business, go on vacation, um, purchase something, gift myself with something. It doesn't have to be huge. That's not the point of this. But it's to have the freedom, the abundance, and the wholeness within you to be able to express it for yourself and have the generosity to be able to give to others as well. If you need help, schedule a clarity session with me. These are sessions that I do that are complimentary to begin with, that we can do some digging. I can help you find out some of the issues. Although in one session, this is just like just a bare, you know, just a, a clarity session, just to get some ideas of what's causing the issues. You know, what are some of the negative beliefs? How I can help you clear them and replace them with empowering beliefs. Now, I've got a lot of experience doing this because for the past 25, 30 years of my life, you know, I've been teaching abundance and manifesting as you probably are aware of. You know, if you've ever had the secrets of manifesting course, creating abundance, et cetera. I've got some... Um, some chops, you know, a lot of experience developed in these catacombs of the subconscious um, and making peace with these parts of us so that we can remember our wholeness. That is the key to this whole thing. Without wholeness, you will not experience the abundance that you deserve. Your wholeness doesn't come from your mind. 
It comes from your heart, but it's not one or the other. Everything I've produced lately talks about this beautiful integration of the heart and the mind, otherwise known as the heart mind. So I invite you to live in a state of gratitude and abundance through your heart mind, getting in touch with who you are in the deepest and truest sense. So be it now.